In 1949, Taiwan was in the midst of an extraordinary population boom unlike anything it had seen before. In less than three years, the island's population surged by over 2 million people, signifying a remarkable 25% increase in total population. However, what made the surge even more unusual was that it included 600,000 soldiers. Yet this was no invasion. The boom was caused by the Republic of China's government and its remaining soldiers retreating from a war they had just lost. For the previous 22 years, China had been engulfed in a colossal civil war between the Chinese communists led by Mao Zedong and the nationalist government headed by Chiang Kai-shek. Yet for most of this period, Taiwan itself was not controlled by either. It was a colony, being used and exploited by the Japanese Empire in its ambitions to conquer East Asia. As the tides of the Second World War shifted, Taiwan found itself isolated and powerless, unable to halt the bombing campaigns that destroyed virtually every piece of important infrastructure and industry. As the war drew to a close, Taiwan was returned to China, but instead of being rebuilt, its resources were siphoned away to fight in the Civil War. As the communists took the upper hand, and the nationalists fled to Taiwan, neither side saw this as the end of the conflict. As such, Taiwan for the next three decades was ruled, not as a newly formed nation, but as a military outpost defined by the heaviest military burden in the world and led by a ruthless authoritarian government. After enduring years of colonization, relentless warfare, and an influx of refugees, Taiwan by 1950 was extremely poor, with a GDP per capita lower than that of Haiti, Madagascar, and the Congo. With the specter of war looming on the horizon, and being led by a government that prioritized the military at the expense of development, Taiwan appeared to have little hope. Yet today, Taiwan stands as one of the most developed countries on Earth. Its median wealth per adult is surpassed in Asia only by Japan, while it outperforms economic powerhouses like Germany and even the United States. Its people are among the most educated, its government is among the most democratic, and its industries dominate the global economy in seemingly impossible ways. Just a single company, Foxconn, is speculated to produce 40% of the world's consumer electronics, and up until recently, 80% of all iPhones. Moreover, the country maintains a near monopoly on the manufacturing of semiconductors, a crucial component that powers everything in the modern world from guided missiles to modern cars and even the device you are using to watch this very video. From a colony of a militaristic empire to a thriving democracy, and from a backwards agrarian society to a technological superpower, this is a remarkable story of Taiwan. Like every country we talk about on this channel, understanding Taiwan's story and its economic development can be a real challenge, and your perspective on these issues may be largely informed by where you get your news. For example, news outlets in the United States and China will surely frame events in Taiwan differently. Even within the US, a news outlet that leans left might have a different take than one that leans right. This can directly impact public opinion and make it difficult to see the full picture, which is why I'm excited about today's sponsor. Ground News is a website and app that lets you compare and contrast news stories from thousands of outlets around the world and across the political spectrum. Let's take a look at this story about the US-Taiwan trade deal. First, you get a concise overview of the key issues. Then, you get a breakdown of the sources covering the event, their political leanings, who actually owns the companies presenting the news, and the factuality of their reporting. You can compare headlines and read entire articles from news outlets around the world in one place. They even have a blind spot feature, which presents you with stories only being covered by one side of the political spectrum that you might have otherwise missed out on knowing. So if you want to become a smarter news consumer, gaining not only deeper insights into important issues, but in understanding how various outlets attempt to guide your opinion, then use my link in the description below to get 30% off unlimited access to a really powerful news platform. For two centuries leading up to 1894, Taiwan occupied an odd position in Asia. It was technically under China's rule, but had mostly been left to fend for itself. China was uninterested in ruling the island directly, instead its goal was merely to keep a watchful eye over it. Indeed, 
Taiwan had a reputation for causing China problems, often serving as a base for pirates, hostile countries, and rebels seeking to topple the Chinese government. Despite this, trade, especially in food, blossomed between the two, with Taiwan becoming a vital food supplier for Southeast China. But this all changed in 1894 as war broke out against the emerging Asian power, the Japanese Empire over Korea. Japan, having recently modernized its military and industry, secured six months of unopposed victories, ultimately forcing China to acknowledge Korea's independence and surrender control of Taiwan. Following a brutal invasion, Taiwan became Japan's very first colony. A rigid and expansive control system was implemented, transforming the island into a police state notorious for its intense and frequently violent suppressions of the population. At this stage, Taiwan was characterized by stark underdevelopment, widespread poverty, and a primarily agrarian economy. Its infrastructure was poor, infectious diseases frequently ravaged the populace, and a mere 13% of the population had access to any form of education. Japan, however, had plans to modernize the island, not for the welfare of the Taiwanese, but to turn Taiwan into a productive colony that served the empire's interests. Adopting the policy Industry for Japan, Agriculture for Taiwan, the colonial government implemented comprehensive reforms to amplify the island's agricultural output. A legal basis for land ownership was crafted to motivate landowners to invest in their property. The island's first banks were established to allow farmers access to superior seed variations, modern equipment, and fertilizer. Agricultural schools were built to transfer Japan's advanced farming techniques to local farmers, while giant projects were undertaken to establish irrigation systems. Within just 30 years, Taiwan's food production increased fourfold. To sustain this massive growth, new railroads, highways, and telegraph lines were built to facilitate food transportation. In a synchronized effort, the Japanese poured resources into education to enhance productivity. While the Taiwanese were limited to primary and vocational education, the Japanese occupation led to a tenfold increase in the number of schools and a surge in educational enrollment, from a mere 10,000 students to almost a million. In 30 years, Taiwan transformed into precisely what the Japanese had envisioned, a fertile food basket that further bolstered Japan's industrialization efforts. However, by the early 1930s, the world took a turn for the worse. Faced with global economic recession and an increasingly militaristic outlook, the Japanese empire embarked on its expansionist agenda. Given its strategic location, modern infrastructure, and educated workforce, Taiwan was handpicked as the new production base for military necessities. The crown jewel of this endeavor was a hydroelectric power plant situated near Sun Moon Lake. Completed in 1934 at a tremendous cost, the power plant stood as one of the largest in Asia. The abundant, low-cost energy it generated spurred the growth of Taiwan's metal, cement, shipbuilding, fertilizer, and chemical industries. However, as Taiwan's industrialization gained momentum, World War II dealt a devastating blow. Resources were redirected to support Japan's front line, and U.S. air raids ravaged Taiwan's cities, infrastructure, and industrial zones. By the war's end, 40% of railroads, 3 out of 4 power plants, and most vital factories were in ruins. As the Japanese finally surrendered, Taiwan was returned to the Republic of China in October 1945. On the night of February 27, 1947, a Taiwanese widow was violently accosted by Tobacco Monopoly Enforcement Team in Taipei for illicitly selling smuggled cigarettes. Their brutal handling of the situation incited a public uproar that quickly snowballed into an island-wide anti-government uprising. The new government in charge, led by the KMT political party, violently suppressed the uprising, later rounding up and executing suspected supporters, including prominent professionals and politicians. This tragic event, known as the February 28th incident, led to an estimated death toll of 28,000. This was not a mere spontaneous outburst, but the climax of growing tensions between the Taiwanese and their new leaders. Initially welcomed as liberators, the Chinese authorities soon revealed their oppressive and corrupt nature. They labeled the Taiwanese as traitors requiring re-education, while they took control of Taiwan society and industrial sectors. 
This situation worsened with the resumption of the Chinese Civil War, as the government pillaged Taiwanese resources to support their war efforts against the communists, combined with an influx of 2 million Chinese refugees and the mismanagement of former Japanese industries. Soaring unemployment and hyperinflation followed, with the price of rice increasing 400-fold within two years. Amid a faltering war effort and the February 28th incident, the government amplified its repressions against the populace, instituting martial law and beginning a four-decade-long era known as the White Terror. Political activities such as protests, strikes, and assemblies were strictly prohibited. Mere suspicion of communist affiliation, anti-government activism, or even expressing dissent against the government often led to executions. An all-encompassing surveillance network infiltrated every facet of society, casting a suffocating shadow of fear and terror across the nation. With the war decisively turning against them in 1949, the KMT government fled to Taiwan. But in their perspective, the war was far from over. Subsequent policies, reforms, and strategies were based on the premise of using Taiwan as a base to eventually reclaim all of China. Accordingly, the government sought to achieve two initial objectives, to curb the ongoing economic crisis and then transform the island into an economic stronghold capable of withstanding an inevitable blockade. To accomplish the first, the KMT had a trick up its sleeve. While escaping from the mainland, they successfully smuggled almost all of China's gold reserves, worth around $200 million. After establishing the new Taiwan dollar, the government utilized these reserves to stabilize inflation and support their massive standing military. Yet these aims were further aided by the United States providing substantial military and economic aid as part of their efforts to contain the spread of communism. Over the next 15 years, the KMT received an astonishing sum of over $3.9 billion, empowering the government to embark on their next objective. In a bid to achieve agricultural self-sufficiency, the government implemented sweeping land reforms. The issue in Taiwan was that a mere 10% of landowners possessed a staggering 60% of the arable land. Using this outsized power, landowners raised rents until tenants were barely growing enough to feed themselves. This stifled investment and ultimately was a drag on productivity, as increased output did not translate to much more income for farmers. The government started by limiting rents to 37.5% of the total annual crop yields. Next, the government sold 100,000 families small plots of public land at discounted rates. Finally, in 1953, the government took all excess land from landowners who held more than three hectares, later selling this land to tenants for essentially nothing. This single reform effectively transferred 13% of Taiwan's entire GDP from the richest to the poorest. In doing so, farmers saw their incomes triple, and now that they owned the land they worked, there was added incentives to invest in better irrigation systems, mechanized equipment, and to use more fertilizer. Within 16 years, the value of agricultural output doubled. Taiwan gained food self-sufficiency, and it was now a leading exporter in a range of agricultural goods. On top of this, because farmers' incomes had risen so much, the government was able to squeeze revenues from them, selling fertilizer at higher than market prices and mandating the purchase of rice at lower than market prices. Utilizing these extra resources, the government then set its sights on industry. In order to promote re-industrialization and more importantly to conserve limited currency reserves, the government implemented policies aimed at replacing imported goods with local substitute products. A huge list of restrictions, tariffs, regulations, and currency exchange controls made it very expensive to import most goods. As planned, this left room for the government to establish large state-supported companies who produced basic industrial materials. In theory, new private companies would form and use these industrial materials to create final products. This would then reduce imports and thus prevent the outflow of national wealth. Initially, these policies proved effective, leading to rapid growth in various state-supported industries such as cement, plastics, textiles, and construction. However, with a limited number of customers to sell to and low purchasing power among them, industries quickly found themselves unable to find buyers for the products they produced. And as exchange controls made exports unprofitable, the economy quickly became oversaturated as demand could never match supply. 
By the late 1950s, growth began to stagnate, while imports remained crucial to support Taiwan's vast military and civilian government, causing currency reserves to dwindle and inflation to rise again. To make matters worse, the United States, in a plot to coerce further reforms, planned to cut off aid by 1965. Faced with these mounting issues, the KMT realized that without intervention, the economy would plunge into crisis. By the late 1950s, the KMT had just one option to compensate for the outflow of currency reserves. It needed to dramatically increase exports. Despite being fiercely contested among top officials, the flood of reforms began in 1958. The exchange rates were unified and then substantially devalued, making imports more expensive, but crucially making Taiwan's exports more attractive to foreign buyers. Additionally, export tariffs were dismantled, while companies that sold their goods abroad were offered income tax breaks and low interest loans. Yet the most important initiative was the creation of Taiwan's first export processing zone in 1966. Strategically situated near the port of Kiaosheng, this zone was specifically designed to lure foreign manufacturers. They were offered a 0% tax rate for the first five years, were able to import all necessary machines and materials without paying import duties, and they were guaranteed an abundant supply of cheap land, power, and most importantly, educated labor. The timing of all of this couldn't be better. With inflation and labor costs rising in rich countries, and innovations like containerization reducing international shipping costs, corporations now had a strong incentive to take advantage of Asia's lower manufacturing costs. Within just two years, Taiwan's export processing zone was filled to capacity, with 120 companies who employed over 50,000 workers. The early arrivals included tech giants like IBM, Philips, and Texas Instruments, who began manufacturing a wide variety of consumer electronics. By 1977, the zone was churning out 7 million TVs annually. Taiwan's economy started booming, yet something unexpected was happening in the countryside, which was turning this boom into a miracle. As American retailers struggled to source products at prices demanded by consumers, they increasingly turned to Japanese trading companies to find cheap manufacturers. However, even by the mid-1960s, these trading companies found that wages in Japan were too high for producing labor-intensive products. As such, they started leveraging their expertise to cultivate reliable suppliers in countries with cheaper labor costs. The two primary locations they targeted were South Korea and Taiwan. While South Korea specialized in large-scale, capital-intensive mass production, Taiwan, constrained by limited government support, specialized in low-end, short-cycle consumer goods. As small orders started to trickle in, rural families combined the savings they had acquired after the land reforms to construct many concrete factories on the land they had been given for essentially free. The Japanese trading companies then supplied them with materials, equipment, and technical know-how. Their modest size and minimal overhead, coupled with low labor costs, enabled the production of inexpensive yet quality goods. This in turn led to larger orders. However, instead of increasing the size of their businesses to fulfill orders, owners helped their extended families, friends, and even their employees to make their own independent factories, eventually forming subcontracting networks where production was distributed. They did this to mitigate investment risk, as future orders were never guaranteed. However, this production structure gave Taiwanese manufacturers a critical global advantage. They were able to quickly change production lines, keep unit prices minimal, and have short order to delivery times. This then led to ever-increasing orders and ever-expanding networks of production, until the countryside became dotted with thousands of interacting mini factories. This advantage allowed Taiwan to dominate a variety of product types, producing 75% of the world's umbrellas, 46% of the world's athletic shoes, and becoming a global leader in the production of clothing, toys, bicycles, and later electronics. By the 1970s, these networks were producing products in 2,100 different categories and had become the driving force within the economy. In just 10 years after reforms, exports grew 450%, the trade deficit was closed, and GDP per capita more than doubled. 
Yet Taiwan in the 1970s entered a politically precarious era. Due to a shift in power, Taiwan was expelled and replaced by the People's Republic of China in the United Nations. Then, in 1972, in order to outflank the Soviet Union, President Richard Nixon traveled to China and shook hands with Mao Zedong, shortly after establishing formal diplomatic relations. Nation after nation did the same, and in doing so, were forced to break diplomatic relations with Taiwan. Coupled with the death of Chiang Kai-shek in 1975, the KMT's aspirations of taking back China had forever died. As Kai-shek's son, Chen Kuo, assumed the presidency, the government's policies finally shifted to developing Taiwan as their new home. Coinciding with these developments, Taiwan's infrastructure was hitting its limits, while two global oil shocks had stagnated the economy. Chen Kuo, influenced by his 12-year education in the Soviet Union, initiated a giant state-led economic planning campaign called the 10 Major Construction Projects. In five years, a state-of-the-art airport was built, the country's first freeway and nuclear power plant were constructed, two new ports and two new rail lines were laid down, and several large state-owned industries, including a petrochemical refinery, a steel plant, and a major shipyard were established. All of these projects laid the groundwork for further industrialization and had kick-started economic growth. However, the government became increasingly concerned with Taiwan's hold over cheap manufacturing. Wages had steadily increased, while many new developing countries began to threaten the country's competitive advantage. The government's answer to this was a drive to develop high-tech manufacturing. First, educational spending doubled, with an emphasis placed on higher education. Then, in 1973, the Industrial Technology Research Institute was founded, with the purpose of developing new technologies and transferring them to the private sector. In 1976, the Institute hit a major breakthrough when it persuaded the American company RCA, who had recently decided to exit the computer business, to train 37 engineers on how to design and manufacture integrated circuits. Three years later, a joint venture between the Institute and local companies created the United Microelectronics Corporation to produce application-specific integrated circuits. Then, in 1987, the Institute established a joint partnership with Philips to create the world's first semiconductor foundry. The idea was to construct a plant that would make semiconductors for other companies on demand and to their specification. Therefore, the plant would not have to worry about picking the winning designs. The companies that create the winning designs would use the plant to make their products. This was the birth of TSMC, which along with the United Microelectronics Corporation became semiconductor titans, with Taiwan eventually gaining control over 60% of global production and 90% for the most advanced chips. But while the government helped to nurture tech giants, Taiwan's manufacturing networks had grown to outcompete the foreign electronics companies in the export processing zones. Initially starting out as component suppliers for foreign TV manufacturers, the networks by the 1980s had come to dominate the entire manufacturing chain due to their advantageous characteristics. And with the rise of personal computers, laptops, MP3 players, and eventually smartphones, all of which demanded yearly upgraded models at the lowest prices, the Taiwanese networks, combined with state-supported companies supplying the critical components, became global leaders in consumer electronics manufacturing. By the 1980s, Taiwan's economy seemed unstoppable. In 20 years, its economy had increased six-fold. It was now a leading global manufacturer for cheap and high-tech products, and its people had risen from poor tenant farmers to ones that could afford cars and send their children to universities. Yet as wages increased, manufacturers increasingly found it difficult to make a profit, a problem that was about to suddenly become much worse. On September 22, 1985, the Plaza Accord was signed by Germany, France, the United Kingdom, Japan, and the United States. Troubled by a ballooning trade deficit, the United States had negotiated the devaluing of the US dollar against the other major currencies. In theory, this would boost U.S. exports, revitalize manufacturing, and fix the deficit. Despite not signing the original agreement, 
Taiwan was all but forced by the United States to comply with the accord in 1987. In two years, the new Taiwan dollar increased in value by 50%, and almost instantly, the country had a strange new issue. It had too much money and too little profit. The increased currency value led to speculation, causing stocks to increase by 12-fold while property prices quadrupled. Yet, at the same time, manufacturing profits had completely vanished, as costs paid for in new Taiwan dollars increased, while revenues paid out in US dollars decreased in value. While the bubble eventually burst in 1990, it was already too late for many manufacturers as profits remained elusive. There was now only three options, either close down forever, upgrade to higher end products, or move to a country with lower labor costs. The last option was made possible due to the government finally letting go of authoritarianism. Indeed, Ching Kuo had been gradually loosening political controls while slowly opening the path toward democracy. Doing so was both out of pressure from growing Taiwanese movements against the government and in realizing that after losing international recognition in the United Nations, liberalizing the nation's politics would be critical for sustaining foreign support. In 1986, the first opposition party was allowed to be formed, protests and free press were no longer forbidden, and in 1987, martial law was finally lifted after almost four decades. Now having the ability to freely travel and move money outside of Taiwan, an exodus began for labor-intensive manufacturing, and one location in particular loomed the most attractive yet scariest. China, having recently enacted reforms to grow its economy, began to actively court Taiwanese companies to invest in the country. Much like Taiwan had done in the 1960s, China offered tax breaks, cheap land, and high-quality infrastructure. Despite China remaining hostile to Taiwan's existence, almost all the major labor-intensive industries had started the move. By 1991, in just a single Chinese province, Taiwanese companies had established 4,000 factories which employed over 2 million people. As Chinese exports boomed, increasing by a staggering 2,812% by 2007, a surprising amount of those goods were produced by Taiwanese-owned factories. In 2005, 7 in the top 10 exporting companies in China were Taiwanese-owned. Taiwan's companies had facilitated China's rise to becoming the world's manufacturer, and in return, Taiwanese companies had grown larger than ever before. But while Taiwanese companies have reaped the benefits of China's rise, ever since labor-intensive manufacturers started their exodus out of Taiwan, the once plentiful manufacturing jobs that supported middle-income lifestyles have all but disappeared. And despite headquarters, research and development departments, and capital-intensive manufacturing remaining in Taiwan, wages when adjusted for inflation have stagnated since 2000. Meanwhile, the situation in China is quickly changing. With rising labor and land costs, the disappearance of many tax incentives, and escalating political tensions, Taiwanese manufacturers have started to worry about their future in China. Some have already started the move to Southeast Asia, Africa, and even back to Taiwan. But while manufacturers may move once again, Taiwan's situation remains just as it always has, subject to the more powerful nations that surround it. The Chinese dynasties aim to subdue it, the Japanese Empire aim to exploit it, and the KMT aim to establish it as a military outpost. Today, China aims to reunify it, whether through peaceful means or by force. As China grows more powerful, so do its threats. Yet amidst the surrounding turmoil, it's the resilience of the Taiwanese people that have catalyzed profound change, transforming the nation within mere generations from a land marked by its struggling tenant farmers to an industrial and technological powerhouse. In the ever-shifting tides of geopolitics, Taiwan's true strength lies not just in its industries, but in the enduring spirit of its people, a spirit that promises to light the way, regardless of external pressures, toward a future of its own design. <laughs>